This is the Jail Ministry Podcast. The J-A-I-L, or Jesus Acts and Inmates Lives Ministry, is Christ-centered and provides programs focused on the prevention and intervention for the incarcerated. Jail Ministry also provides support to offenders, criminal justice professionals, victims, and their families. Thank you for your continued financial assistance. For more information, visit jailmen.org. Now, here's today's lesson. Hello and welcome to Jail Ministry today. We are glad that you are with us today as we study God's Word. It's good to be back here. Uh, just had a little temporary break and I am glad to dig right back into temptation. Uh, we have done temptation one, temptation two, and today we are going to do temptation three. Now, the first lesson we did kind of an overview of temptation focused on James 1, chapter 1. So if you haven't listened, I would encourage you to go back and listen. And then on temptation 2, we went back to creation, the fall of man, and then temptation. So I'll just do a quick, quick review. But today we're going to do temptation 3. And we're going to be specifically talking about what was the meaning and purpose of Jesus's temptation in the New Testament. So, if you have your Bible, we're going to open it up to Matthew chapter 4. We'll be going between chapter 4 and Genesis chapter 3. I would encourage you to take some notes. I will be giving you some scripture. So, in addition to what we talk about today, you'll want to go back and do some homework. Now, I have been wanting to do a lesson uh, on temptation for quite some time. And usually in jail, I have a certain process that I go through. And this time, I want wanted to do a little bit differently so that I'm digging deeper into temptation and I'm realizing that there's going to be a lot of lessons on temptation, uh, not only from the Old Testament, but the New Testament as well. This lesson in particular is intriguing because there's some foundational issues that I want to put before you for you to examine before we go on. Now, first and foremost, one of my first memory, scripture memory verses was 1 Corinthians 10, 13. For no temptation has overcome you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to, tempt, will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape. Now, understand that many of our lessons are directed towards encouraging Christians. But I also understand, and I don't make the assumption anymore, that most people are Christians. Because even in America, they're not. Uh, even when I go overseas, people think all Americans are Christians. I'm like, oh, far from it. They are not. So no matter where you are at, in jail, out of jail, being persecuted, wherever you're at, I think this lesson will encourage you. Whether you are a Christian or not. Now, I tend to look at people in two different ways. You're either unsaved or you're saved. And I say this over and over again. You either are not born again and not have the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is God in the flesh. Or you do. You are born again. Not of the flesh. Not of the will of man, but of the Spirit. So there's two different distinctions between people today. Either you are unsaved or you're saved. Now, a lot of the unsaved people, they will read Christian books or fun books, whatever, and they'll take Christian sayings, like here's a big one, doesn't the Bible say you should not judge? And they'll take it out of context. They do it all the time because they're not Christians. But even Christians do it too. I find that there's some, say, euphemisms or some teachings about temptation that are in error also. And so in order to correct error, where do we go? We go to the Bible. So let's dig into temptations. Now, James, we know, we already did a lesson. The first lesson we did was on temptations. It talks about where do temptations come from? Where do they arise? Let's backtrack a little bit. Let's go in the Bible to the book of James, chapter 1. Verse 12, and I'm just going to read this, but I would encourage you to go back and look and listen to the whole lesson. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, 
he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. If Jesus is not your Lord and Savior, then this is not a promise to you. Okay? Plain and simple. Let no one say when he is tempted, like Adam did, okay? I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. So I'll ask my inmate ladies, can God tempt people? And they'll say, yeah. Well, the Bible says no. He can test us, but God does not tempt us. Now, this little reference here, let no one say when he is tempted in verse 13, like Adam did, because when Adam and Eve sinned, who did Adam blame? He actually blamed God. This woman whom you've given me. Yeah, he actually did. But they both sinned. And they both fell. Verse 14, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Did you notice it didn't say your friend sitting next to you or your buddy? Well, it was his drugs or he bought the alcohol and he brought it over to my place. No, it says your own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So why do 10 out of 10 people die? Because of sin. And the question then becomes, what do we do with the sin issue? So let's get back to temptation. So we, we've covered that. Now I want to go back to Genesis chapter 3 very quickly. Where do we see temptation first in the Bible? Well, clearly in the garden, we see in chapter 2 of Genesis, God created everything. Created man and woman on the pinnacle for six a day. Created male and female. Not female and female, nor male and male. Male and female. Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. It's very clear. To be in a covenant relationship in marriage. God created, or he planted, it says in verse 8, God planted a garden. And he put the man whom he had formed into the garden. So now we have a garden. And I'm paraphrasing here a little bit, okay? Just for speed of context. I apologize for some of those. But God said, he, he had all the trees in the garden, there is a tree of life, and there is a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God said, you shall not eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So we see this clearly, and Adam is the head of the human race, all right? Eve had actually, all right, she doesn't even get named until chapter 3, by the way. So we see that Adam and Eve were told they could eat of any trees in the garden but that one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, then we come to chapter 3. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field. Now we don't know that this was a snake. Just like we don't know the fruit that was taken was an apple. It doesn't say that. We should be careful about reading too much, it's called eisegesis, into the scripture. We don't need to do that. We just know that it was a serpent. And that the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Remember this. God made angels. This particular angel, Satan, fell, rebelled against God. So now here he is speaking to the woman in this garden. Now this would probably trip me out. This would freak me out. I mean, the only verse, voices that she's heard is God, the Lord, walking in the garden, and Adam. And now, this creature is talking. That would, that would mess with my brain. And listen to what he says, though. He says to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree in the garden? Ah, that's a big hint there. Satan will always get us to question God as creator and what God says, what he says verbally, what he says in writing. The woman answers the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. 
Now, Eve added there, you shall not touch it. Yeah, that's not good. We should not add or take away from what God says here. Then we're getting to temptation. Here we go. Then the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. Now, Adam was there with Eve. We see that. We know that because it says that here in Scripture. I don't know what his motive is. I can't say that. But God said they would die. Did they die? Yeah, they began to die physically. Even though they, they lived probably eight, 900 years old. We know how old Adam was. So even though they lived many, many years, they began to die physically. Also, there's a play on words here in verse 3, lest you die. Satan knew this. There is dying physically, and then there is dying spiritually. And they died spiritually. So when the Bible says that you were dead in your sins and your trespasses, it means they were spiritually dead. dead spiritually dead men cannot hear, and spiritually dead women cannot hear or see. This is important to understand. So, temptation. Verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. He is the head of all mankind. Whence he ate, their eyes were opened. And they tried to hide their sin. How many times do we try to hide our sin? All the time. Back to temptation. Which leaves me, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 4 in the temptation of Jesus. What was the meaning, the purpose of Jesus' temptation? Well, let me set some ground rules here. Understanding that in Genesis, God created everything and the whole world. Then he creates and plants a garden. Okay? And he puts Adam and Eve in this perfect, perfect environment. They had want for nothing. God provided everything. He just said, you cannot eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So that was a perfect environment. And then we get to the temptation of Jesus. And we're going to be in Matthew chapter 4. So let's read this passage together. It's very important. And let me say from the outset, the same three temptations that we saw or we see in here in our lives are the same when Satan approached Adam and Eve and when Satan approached Jesus. We know this. We should learn from it. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. The Bible has a lot to say about each of these, which we're going to cover in temptation. But this one in particular got my attention because unlike Adam and Eve, who were put into the garden that God planted and had want for nothing, Jesus is going to be run out into the wilderness and he's going to fast for 40 days and 40 nights. I don't know about y'all, but I'd probably be dead or on my last leg. So here you see these contrasts in scripture between the first Adam and the second Adam. We see this not only with the first Adam, Christ is referred to as the second Adam. We also see this sometimes with Moses being a type of Jesus. Abraham David, king, prophet, priest, king. We see these contrasts between how man failed, but Jesus did not fail in any way, including being tempted, and he yet did not sin. So let's read this. Then Jesus was led. Now, by the way, what is this following? This is following in Jesus' humanity. He's divine and human. He was baptized to fulfill God's law and his humanity. So this follows. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So there's Jesus run out into the wilderness and he's going to be tempted by the devil. Just like Adam was. 
And when he, meaning Jesus, had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter, it's another name for Satan, okay, came to him, he said, if, oh, he knew exactly who Jesus is. But Satan says, the tempter says, if you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. What is that? That's flesh. Take a little note. That's a temptation to the flesh. But Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's Jesus' response. We're going to go back and we're going to look at this closely. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, Oh, Satan's quoting this now, okay? He shall give his angels charge over you. He knows who Jesus is, and he's even saying it is written. He knows the scriptures, but he twists the scriptures. We shouldn't do it. He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. This is a temptation towards pride. Thinking that he's better than everybody else. Verse 7, Then Jesus said to him, It is written, there it is again, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Yes, the Lord is still the Lord, and God is still God. And Jesus is Lord. Verse 8, again, the devil took him up on an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. This is a temptation to the eyes. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. This passage is loaded. There is so much I want to say when I read this, but I can't. But there is a little thing here that I want to go back, because this tripped me up many years ago. It says here in verse 9, and Satan said to him, Jesus, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Were these things Satan's? Yes, they were. Now, Jesus is Lord over all. But you have to understand that Adam and Eve sinned and they abdicated, became slaves to sin, to Satan. Satan has been for many, many years, Jesus even acknowledges, we're going to talk about ruler of this world. Now that word world has many definitions, primarily four. But yes, he could come to Jesus and he did to tempt Jesus with what he's saying. That he would give Jesus all of this if he would fall down and worship him. The ultimate authority, of course, is Jesus. But that world of Satan... Even though Jesus is ultimate authority, he could come to Jesus and say, hey, I'll give all of this to you if, you'll, if you will worship, fall down and worship him. I think it's beautiful that we see the contrast here and the similarities. We see the contrast between the first Adam and the second Adam. The first Adam failed. The second Adam did not. He will not. Even though Jesus was tempted the same three ways, he did not sin. Some people say, well, he didn't because he's divine. You have to remember that Jesus took on flesh. He is human also. It says a lot for us as Christians when we have the Spirit of God dwelling within us. Does this mean we're God? No. 
But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. Notice also, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and pride. What are yours? I had to go back and I had to examine lust of the eyes, the flesh, which I'm going to do tonight in jail with my ladies. They had homework this last week. So that we don't just look at this from afar, that we look at this in our own personal lives. Mine would be pride. I don't need anybody else's help. Or I remember thinking before I was a Christian, I'm better than anybody else. It's pretty hard to maintain that stance. I had to be humbled. What's yours? What's your temptation? For women, it's different than men. My husband and I have lots of conversations about this. He too works in jail ministry. He volunteers so he can't get fired. <laughs> and we love it. But he will say that so many of these men, and I will say some of these women, are into pornography. Does the Bible have anything to say about that? Oh, yeah. Lust of the eyes, sexual sins, a lot. We could do lesson after lesson on sexual sins. And just because you're tempted to sexual, sexually sin, doesn't mean that you have to give in to it. Not if you are a Christian. I'm speaking to the Christian right now. We know how Satan operates. We know what his objectives are. And that's to destroy mankind. Jesus' objective is to save mankind. So if you are a Christian, I'm a Christian, I know that there are going to be attacks. But I also know who my Lord and Savior is, and that's Jesus. I also know, and I was taught, I worked for two retired colonels in my career. This was many years ago. I also worked for a Medal of Honor, fine gentleman, Vietnam War. And he taught me very well. And he said, Rhonda, if you want to win this war, you need to pick your battles. And you need to know who your enemy is. And in those tough situations that I was involved in, I learned to pick my battles. If I wanted to end on a winning situation, I had to learn to pick my battles. We're at war. We're at war with evil today. Satan is already at war with us. I already know how my enemy operates. How do I win? How do I pick my battles? I already know how he's going to come at me to tempt me, as he's called the tempter. You already know how he's going to approach you. Sometimes I think of things in analogy like the front door, like he's got his foot in my front door. I can either slam the door in his face or I can let him have a foot in the door. What are you going to do? Notice here also, very importantly, Jesus said it is written. If we learn one thing from this, and it is knowing how the enemy operates, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and pride, I would encourage you to think deep, dig deep on this so that you can fight. And God doesn't give you a feather duster. He gives you a sword, an armor to arm yourself. We are not weak, quote, Christians. Yeah, we are weak in some aspects. But this was one of the passages that encouraged me to arm myself with the Word of God. Do you know His truth? Each time, now Satan knows the Word. He knows his days are numbered. But Jesus each time said, it is written. And he quotes scripture. There are numerous times that Matthew, Mark, Luke, Paul, they all quote scripture. Did you notice that? 
This was what compelled me to do scripture memorization. And in those hard times in my life, and you are maybe in a difficult place right now, in your hard time in your life, are you just going to talk to yourself? Talk yourself out of it? Talk yourself out of sin? Or are you going to quote scripture? This word is living and active and stronger than a two-edged sword. There's a lot to see and to hear here. Notice also Satan used the trick, if you are the son of God. Did he really say? He's questioning all the time what God says. If you're unsure what God says, where do you go? I mean, I'll go to a friend and reason with a friend, talk to a friend about it. But ultimately, prayer and the Word of God. So in order to fight this war, you need to be armed with the Word of God. Not just up here in your head, but in your heart, on your tongue. It's a heart issue, not necessarily a mind issue. There are many temptations that we sadly fall into because our flesh is naturally weak. But we have God who will not let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. Now I hear non-Christians quote this all the time. They just kind of throw it out there. That's for the Christian. That's who it's written to in 1 Corinthians. It says that he will provide a way out. And that is 1 Corinthians 10.13. I would encourage you to begin your scripture memorization, if you haven't already, with that verse. We can, therefore, be victorious. And I say content. And we can thank the Lord for delivering us from temptation. Notice also that there is an assumption that we're going to be tempted. And we can't just always say the devil made me do it. No, no. It's our sin. We own our sin. In fact, in Genesis, when Cain killed Abel, God told him that you are to rule over sin. You, me, are to rule over sin. So Jesus' experience in the wilderness, in the desert, helps us to see the common temptations that keeps us from doing what? I think these keep us from worshiping God as Lord and Savior, from serving God effectively, especially when our mind and our heart is so focused on sinning. We learn from Jesus' response to the temptations how we are to respond. How? With Scripture. The forces of evil come to us with a myriad of temptations. I mean, there's, I can't even make a list of how many there are. And we're going to talk about some of those and what Jesus said about them. But all have the same things at their core. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and pride of life. We can only recognize and combat these temptations by saturating our hearts and minds with truth. That's how we do it. In prayer. The armor of a Christian soldier, and I'm saying soldier, in the spiritual battle of life includes only one offensive weapon, and that is the sword of the Spirit, He who dwells in me, which is the Word of God. And that's found in Ephesians 6, 17. Knowing the Bible intimately will put the sword in our hands and enable us to be victorious over temptations. I meet people who go to church, set, yeah, they sing the song, sing the hymns, sit in the pews, but they don't sit and read God's word for themselves. 
you need to do so and be armed. So thank you for joining us today. Until next time, we'll look at temptation number four. Come back. Thank you.